Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking with your friends. We examined current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it really deserves. We toss out the screaming heads and put people before political parties and give context to the news to make you think. My name is Chris Spangle, and this is a special series on We Are Libertarians called The Swamp Explained. And my co-host for this series is Rob Cortell. He is a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C., Rob has worked for Republican presidential campaigns, government agencies like the EPA, and has been confirmed by the Senate to the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission. He also has been a candidate for Congress and Senate. And given his experience and iconoclastic viewpoints, Rob gives us a great insight into the swamp, and that makes up our nation's capital. Uh, and we have a special feed now. We have separated all the episodes of the swamp into one single feed. So. If you look up in any podcatcher, The Swamp Explained, you'll find this show. So you can go back and catch up on all the episodes easily or share with your friends. Uh, and Rob, you too. Uh, yep. So that is a new feature that we've got. So make sure that you, uh, you grab that link at wearelibertarians.com and tell your friends. So Rob, how are you doing today? I am doing just peachy keen. It's, uh, uh, you know, the summer has been lovely on the uh, island, <clears throat> but uh, today we're overcast. What can I say? Yeah, well, it's beautiful, 74 and sunny here, and so we're, yeah. we're enjoying it. So hopefully tomorrow it'll be nice. Yes, for <laughs> so, the work day, for the work day. <laughs> if you ever need the weather report, just call me, and I'll tell you what it'll be like tomorrow. So, oh, good. So we, we get your weather first. So we have, a, we have so much that we could talk about. Uh, it's, it's, you know, just the amount of things that Trump has done since Friday. Uh, we, could, we could really <laughs> run on about. Um, I, let's start. Or said, with, he's, or said he's done. Or, or said, said he's done. done. Or said he'd like to do. I'll, <laughs> I'll give you the choice. Do you want to start with Greenland? Do you want to start with being uh, labeled the chosen one? Do you want to start with the economy and the recession? Where Where would you like to start? Well, I think um, I do think I think we could start with Greenland just for a minute because <clears throat> Greenland, which sounds wacky, um, isn't necessarily so wacky. Uh, uh, or at least historically, as a country, we've approached it before. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, but I I do think it's an interesting example, both of his uh, not understanding how uh, the diplomatic and international world works in politics, and the 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 enthusiastic willingness of his critics to jump on everything he says, yeah, willy nilly, you know, and I'm. I'm not trying to defend him per se here, but I, I do think, you know, it's um, they, uh, I think one of the things that we see with so many different issues is sort of the false outrage and the, the hand, hand waving and the, the you know, how, you, how as kids we used to, you know, circle our finger around our temple to indicate somebody was crazy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> sort of a little bit of that. Um, and of course, you know, President Truman made an offer to buy Greenland. And um, I think uh, there was another time way back when and you know the president does have the authority to at least create those kinds of negotiations even before a um, a, uh, a purchase is made, and any purchase would have to be ratified. But uh, so I think Greenland is more symbolic than anything else, and we do have a big base up there. Um, so. That's kind of my take on it. Where's yeah, yours? we apparently have, and, and we had let freeze over some nuclear waste at one of the bases up north during the Cold War, and so there's yeah. the melting ice caps. Yeah, Greenland plays, I, I have marked first the national interest because I think they do a lot of really like neutral, interesting reporting on geopolitical affairs, and the Arctic, the race for the Arctic and the oil within seems to be a constant hot topic that they cover. And Greenland, I think, plays an important part of that. But there's also another piece that I heard this week that Denmark is the last holdout on signing this agreement that would allow the, be, the flowing of natural gas through Russian pipelines. And so Denmark is actually holding out. And so part of the reason that Trump is doing this and causing all this drama is that he's trying to put pressure on Denmark to not sign that agreement that would allow the flow of natural gas to Europe and which uh, that, that's where it always gets to with Trump that's where it's right. like it's the 32d chess argument that his bad behavior plays into some master plan and you never can tell like is it Trump being strategic with his tantrums or is it just Trump is a big giant baby 
you, you never know. Well, so, obviously, but you know what happened? I'm sure what happened is somebody uh, uh, talked in the White House in a briefing about uh, <laughs> the strategic value of Denmark, and we, I mean, of uh, Greenland, and here right. we have a base there, and, and then, oh, by the way, and, uh, and of course, it's, it hasn't exactly fostered a lot of happy talk out of, out of Denmark either as a consequence. So if he's planning to use that to stop them from signing onto the pipeline, um, I, it's probably in a, remarkably ineffective. I'd be yeah. stunned if that were, if that was part of the logic. But I, I would not be surprised if it came up in the context of a discussion like that. Yeah, you've yeah. met presidents, you've worked for presidents, yeah. you understand probably how this works. And it seemed to me just what you said. Somebody around him mentioned this or yeah. mentioned this to him directly. And so he just kind of got other presidents, as far as I've read, just kind of get obsessed with like this one weird idea. Yeah. You know, like here in Indianapolis, the mayor gone by, uh, Ballard, got obsessed with the idea of a cricket field here in Indianapolis. And everybody's like, this is crazy. Stop <laughs> talking about this. You know, the, like they just sort of glom on. That's what this felt like. It was just sort of this thing. And then he was like, well, I'll have fun with it. Well, and of course, it, I think it. Yeah, there's no question it appealed to his um, instincts as a real estate developer, and he, he said so, in fact. So, uh, but, but again, I, th I think the value of the, that is more symbolic than it is uh, whether it's real or not. Uh, you know, it's this, it is this issue of um, uh, how he feels and reacts emotionally to criticism and the steady drumbeat at each other of both sides. You know, yeah. so... It's uh, someone, one of my, one of my, my uh, uh, pro-Trump friends said, you know, he never gets a break. They're always criticizing him. Well, I, I think that's more or less true. Um, there's, of course, a lot to criticize, and he never lets up. So that's why he never gets a break. But um, yeah, so. I, I, I agree, and I think that's sort of the press at this point can't help themselves. They don't realize they're helping create the monster. Well, that's right. That's right. So. Um, well, there we've we've now dispatched Denmark and Greenland. <laughs> yes, and so we we transition right into uh, the chosen one, the, uh, the chosen king one. of the Jews. Yes, so uh, I yeah. actually know Wayne Allen Root, and very few people know this. <laughs> but when Wayne Allen Root ran for chair uh, at the for the National Libertarian Committee, I think in 2010, I'm actually the person that wrote his strategic plan that was passed out. So wow. I. And I was going to be Wayne Allen Root's executive director should he win chair, the chair's race. He, he came sort of close. Uh, and he had sort of a – he had an important lesson on me in that you can't be a political pundit and a party official at the same time because it causes too much strife. And so Wayne's goal was always to get himself on Fox Business and Fox News and write books and write the conscience of a libertarian. And he's a very controversial figure in the libertarian party because he – he really what it comes down to, he was a populist right person. I mean, he Trump is exactly who Wayne Allen Root was always waiting for. I mean, he was it was the second he came out, I thought of Wayne Allen Root because I was like, oh, Wayne's going to love this guy. They're the same person. They have the same sort of attitude. And, you know, Wayne is uh, formerly Jewish and converted to uh, Christianity. And so when he tweeted out that, you know, Israel loves the king of the Jews, and he's the chosen one for the people of Israel. Like, uh, I, as a Christian myself, I look at another Christian, I go, hey, that's sacred language, and you're bordering uh, on profane when you're using it about Donald Trump and political figures. It's like, but the, the real issue is, like, Wayne's just going to say outrageous things, because that's what Wayne has always done. He loves to get attention for himself. Um, you know, he's, he's just, he is who he appears to be on TV. Well, but, so... Yeah, but so, so he's the guy who who uh, who christened him the, the uh, second coming, right? Yeah. So he was saying he's the yeah. second coming. He's the he's the chosen. Well, he's he used the he invoked the King of the Jews language. He wasn't saying he is that. He was saying people in Israel love this guy. I don't know what you're talking about. He is to these people. He's like this. He was he was using hyperbole as Wayne typically does, which Wayne does what he does, and he's a you know, second, third tier pundit because of the way that he presents things. It's when the president picks up on that and tries to promote the idea and, and amplifies that idea. And isn't like, I don't know about you, but if somebody called me the king of the Jews and the chosen one, I would immediately go, well, all right, you're a little out of bounds. Like I got invited to 
uh, participate as a judge in a celebrity dance competition for some like local dance studio. I'm like, easy with the celebrity word. Like, uh, does that mean, you know mean? Well, that's right. And does that mean you're a good dancer? No, so no I, I was the least qualified person <laughs> for a hip hop dance off. <laughs> uh, but, well, but you know, that, this of course raises some other issues too. So, um, actually, one it it uh, reminds me of one of our first conversations about. Um, my friend Bill Strauss in the book Generations and the later book called The Fourth Turning, Cycles of History. Right. And the prediction that um, in the uh, 2010s to early 2020s, that um, a member of the, um, uh, uh, the boomer class would uh, return to save us all from our, fo you know, from our follies. And, and, wow. uh, and the guy who turned that into a movie was Steve Bannon. Yep. And so I always wondered whether Steve Bannon felt he was the the um, the social messiah of sorts, or whether he viewed Trump as the social messiah to save us all from ourselves. But um, but again, you know, it is um, Trump loves all that kind of stuff. He likes to be the best, and and um, that's, so again, it's another one of those things that if um, you can't tell how much he's joking or jabbing. You, you, if you understand the difference. So he yes. likes to jab everybody. Um, and uh, he likes to be the uh, the thrust of the media uh, uh, just 24-7. I mean, that's, I think that we have learned about Trump. It's 24-7 Trump, you know, all channels all the time. And uh, the media likes to help him on that. So, um, you know, I doubt seriously he thinks he's the second coming or, or that he, uh, any of those things. But there's no question that he loves the 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 um the illusion and the uh, reference by your your buddy but again i you know if we take the if we move back away from all this and and think about the broader context of washington and and the swamp and um everything else you know what trump is is a disruptor and what he is disrupting is the the way people see things talk about things do things um uh, make plans about things and um, you know some some of that is at a high level good if you can divorce it from him um, so I know this is a long ways from Trump being a messiah but um, but uh, I do believe in the back of his mind probably is that he is uh, he is the chosen guy who's got the chance to go out there and you know punch the ja the Chinese in the nose and and uh, stomp on the Iranians and uh, push back on the Europeans and, uh, and you know, and cut a deal on, on Jerusalem and blah, 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 blah. So I, so thematically, it does not surprise me in the least. Yeah. So Make any sense? yes. And so on the Messiah complex, because here's the thing with Trump, and this is part of the whole Trump movement that, that it, it's too clever by half there. The, I'm just kidding thing. The, yeah provocation thing provocation for the sake of provocation to make the left cry i get all that and i'm not I, i'm sort of down with that but at a certain point the whole i'm just kidding thing eventually starts to morph into uh him ordering on twitter companies not to work with certain things him him floating the idea that we're going to use amazon right. Al Al alexas to spy on people so they can see if they're like at a certain point, all of this starts to add up into uh, past the I'm just kidding part to this guy really does have some tendencies that are very frightening. And no, this is not, he, he, I don't believe Donald Trump is a fascist. I think he has those tendencies, but right. it, what, what is the long-term implications of the Trump movement and these impulses towards law and order, towards more fascistic ideas that blossom 20, 30, 50 years down the road in the American ecosystem. And I think that to me is the more dangerous part of Donald Trump than Donald Trump himself. Well, again, and again, you know, that raises the question of, is it him or is he the, or is he the, uh, the vessel for mm -hmm. frustrations, which have been around for 25 years and growing and which we see everywhere else, which is the whole populist movement. And I really think it's more populist than it is, fascist per se i think yeah. fascism has you know it's organized thought whether we you know we don't have we don't like it but it's organized thought whereas populism is a kind of it's, it's almost brownian and uh, and 
it, it feeds on itself until something happens to really um, let the air out of it. And right. I don't think we've had that yet. And, uh, and although Trump may well be <laughs> what lets the air out of it um, if he is rejected in uh, 2020. You know, and at this stage, I continue to think that the Democrats are doing everything they can to to uh, lose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. And uh, and uh, I, you know, it's maybe it's a little funny segue from here, but, you know, it's watching uh, Joe Walsh this morning on uh, uh, Stephanopoulos show on TV um, and announcing he's going to run for president against Trump. And of course, the language was the language that the left has primarily been, been using and that the conservatives use during the campaign, but have since zipped their lips around, uh, uh, starting with unfit and, uh, uh, you know, Walsh himself has been a cause of a lot of the, 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 the um, damage to the ecosystem, the political ecosystem and, and civility and everything else that, that uh, led to Trump. You know, he's a guy who, who declared that uh, Obama was a Muslim and, uh, uh, you know, ad nauseum, that kind of statement. Although, again, today, he basically rejected all that and apologized for it and said that he, he felt that he was partly responsible for all that in his talk radio and everything else that he was doing. So, you know, the other, the other side of that is, um, I do think that if, if Walsh, Walsh could gain some traction among uh, uh, some conservatives who consistently say that Trump is not a conservative, except that he himself is not a particularly savory character either. So, yeah. So Walsh, I've followed on Twitter and I find him uh, his anti I, I've just he caught my eye because a, I watched the talk radio world and B, it was weird to see this guy who is a former flamethrower start going after Trump and not try to like you're in talk radio like Donald Trump is talk radio like Donald Trump. Yeah. says the things that I heard when I was sitting at a board in 2005 taking phone calls on immigration. Donald Trump was the caller. Like, he is the, the, the talk radio president. And it, it, it was interesting. And, and so I could see a situation where I would – I don't know much about Joe Walsh, but let's say a mosh. So uh, on the table in terms of right-leaning protest votes – Justin Amash continues to flirt with the idea of running as a Libertarian Party presidential candidate. Lincoln Chafee floated this week that the, the former senator from Rhode Island? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He floated the idea of running as a Libertarian, which I'm not – no thanks. Uh, and then uh, Mark Sanford has been flirting with the idea of running as a Republican or a Libertarian Party candidate for months. Uh, that's been behind the scenes, the former – and so you've got somebody in Sanford who, again, kind of fits within that Walsh framework of formerly part of the problem now has seen the light. Right. Um, right. And I know that that Mr. Rogers himself, John Kasich, as you mentioned before we went on, is is thinking of running, too. Like, do you think that there is a, any kind of path based on your historical knowledge and, and just being around? Do you think there's any path for any of these guys to really make any kind of dent in the race for Trump? Uh, well, I do actually. Um, I do. Um, if you think back to Lyndon Johnson and uh, and uh, when he ran uh, in the spring of sixty fall of sixty seven, I guess, mm -hmm. and into sixty eight, and uh, uh, Gene McCarthy challenged him, and um, he, you know, McCarthy uh, was pretty much out of the mainstream then of the Democratic Party, but. He, I think he sufficiently weakened uh, Johnson, and then uh, Bobby Kennedy came along, and Bobby Kennedy won a couple primaries. California then was assassinated, but all of that really hammered on, um, that hammered Johnson, who withdrew from the race. And I remember watching that as, uh, uh, as a 17 or 18-year-old when he did it, and it was a shock. I don't, you know, of course, I wasn't as knowledgeable about the political process then. Uh, as I am today, 50 years later, but uh, I do. I think that um, I think that I don't think Walsh could beat him, and I think if Walsh beat him, uh, he could win. I don't think he could win, and he himself said that. Really, he he said that if he could just make it so that he weakened Trump enough that he lost, and Scarborough really pressed him today. Well, what if it was 
you know, Elizabeth Warren or somebody else, uh, not Scarborough, I mean, uh, uh, Stephanopoulos, that if uh, it was Elizabeth Warren on the other side, would you want him to lose to Elizabeth Warren? And he really didn't address it directly, but I know, but he, he was essentially saying, I want him to lose. Hmm. So there did is. He, a, did he say why? I mean, I mean, wh- what, a way, what a way to end your career. Because in your own he's movement. unfit, because he's unfit and immoral and, you know, the whole litany of language that he used, you know, in the past about other right. people. Um, and which he is now rejecting. But I do think that he could conceivably, if he got any traction at all, and I'm not saying I'm predicting that he will, but if he got any traction at all, uh, that could provide an opening for um, someone who's a a more serious mainstream Republican like a Kasich. Uh, I don't think Bill Weld has a snowball's chance in hell. No. Um, I, I don't think any of the others do too, but I do think Kasich, could create it could be a rallying cry and as could Romney you know I if if it looked like there was a real opening I you never uh, you should never dismiss uh, the the ego drive to become president by people who've run for it before and lost mm-hmm. so uh, so yes, I think it it feels like Mitt took that position to put himself in that particular position I mean it really yeah I think that's right yeah I, well I think he he just likes public service too but I I don't want to diminish his, uh, you know, the, the call for public service, but, but the other aspect of that is that um, I do think that the big tactical question is, will uh, his, I guess it's his niece, right, who is the chairman of the Republican National Committee. Oh yeah. Uh, what would she do if there was a real candidate who uh, was somewhere out there hammering away for Trump and demanding uh, to be in debates Mm. and um that would be very interesting because i think at this stage um people would no longer be afraid of trump they have nothing to lose uh so uh that could be pretty interesting i sort of feel like the voting population doesn't want challengers to a sitting president like they don't like that but you know the 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 approval ratings for trump is 80 90 percent in the republican party But I feel I, I just think that if ever there was a president that deserved to be challenged from within his own party, it has to be Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, and, and Walsh makes the point that he's really not a conservative, not a Republican, kind of not anything ideologically. Um, and, and of course, for some of us, even a lifelong Republican like, like myself, uh, if he were if he were uh, nothing ideologically and simply a pragmatist, that would be a good thing, yeah. <laughs> you know, because then. It becomes a question of how do you balance out, you know, competing political interests to get, you know, what's the end game and how do you get there? So, if, if he weren't such a narcissist, like, and he just... And he uh, uses that term. Walsh uses that term. Yeah, if he weren't just the poster child for it, if he got off Twitter, his Clintonian centrist, I, I, I really thought that in 2015, 2016, it was like, you know, if Trump can get out of his own way... He could be a particularly effective president yeah. in terms of bringing people together, but he just can't let the need for attention go. It's really kind of, I think if you're, if you really wanted, if you're maybe more of, and maybe you, I'm assigning this to you, you're the type of person who wants government to be effective and run efficiently. Yeah. I, I'm more of the the joker from the dark Knight, where it's like, let's have fun. Uh, but <laughs> um you know, if you're more of your, like, he could have been such a powerful, pragmatic president had he just not been, I don't want to yeah. say mentally ill, but let's dance around it. I mean, he just yeah. is. Well, so here's, here's another alternative thought to you. If he, if he did win, um, again, it's sort of, obviously it's, I think it's far out speculation. If he did win, which I, again, I, I think it's more likely that he will get a second term than not, at least at this point in time. Um, he might also then be freed from the Republican Party. Yeah. And uh, and then it will go his uh, own merry way again. He really doesn't have any particular roots anywhere. And uh, so I suspect a second term would be very different from a first term. And of course, we uh, you have the problem of the Senate. And the House, I think, is very much likely to stay in Democratic in the hands of the Democrats. Uh, I, again, I'm not so sure. I think the Senate's going to change, but I, I think the gap will narrow probably. Long ways out though. What can happen in this, you know, in that period? So. 
Yeah, so I want to I want to ask you about maybe a swamp related question because my working theory is that Donald Trump just illustrates the way that the system works. He is not special and unique to it. He just because of the media scrutiny brings light to things that we don't like and we should change the system. I mean is his is his um narcissism or his just he his feelings of grandeur like is that a very commonplace thing that that sense that he's a man of history like do you do you pick up on as you work work around these circles like are there a lot of people who that have that kind of right. attitude towards their own mm-hmm. position and and sense in in the government and history so 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 over um and, you know, I don't always have direct experience, but over the last 50 years uh, it, as an adult in Washington, um, I think the, the main lesson over time is that most people, when they take on a national office and responsibility, kind of grow up to it. They, they step up to it and, and they can't always, they don't always succeed and they're not always capable. But I do think most people, whether they're a cabinet secretary or uh, you know, or a federal maritime commission or anything else, you sort of, uh, or president, you, you realize you're in a public position and you, um, you, you have some obligations there, which yes, they, they fall into the bounds of what you call normalcy <laughs> somewhere. Maybe that's the swamp, but, um, but then there's some who don't, you know, there are others who, who think of it as a, as a, um, a party or a place to make money or things like that. Um, and and uh, I certainly have known several people who were convicted of uh, really what was petty corruption. You know, I knew a, a guy who was uh, head of the St. Lawrence Seaway who essentially went to jail for padding his uh, expense reports in the realm of under $1,000. Uh, you know, there was a congressman, later governor of Connecticut, uh, Roland, who went to jail for accepting really very modest um, uh, you know, bribes of, you know, work around his house and other kinds of things. Uh, you know, Ted Stevens was convicted of that similar uh, corruption. And so there's a kind of, sometimes there's a kind of sloppiness that creeps in. And sometimes... Uh, Jack, Jack Abramoff and Tom Yeah, Blake. Abramoff and those guys. And although I, I think in his case, it was probably didn't creep in. I think it was there. <laughs> <laughs> it was a feature, not a bug. A feature, yeah. yes, right. So, and you know, and I know that when I was uh, commissioner, uh, I I gave so many speeches, and I had a budget. You know, every public official typically has a travel budget that they can use for, you know, that's sort of non-obligated, meaning in a way that they can use it for things that aren't that are part of the official duties, but which are not necessarily planned in advance. And uh, I, if I recall, it was probably not even twenty thousand dollars. And I had more speeches because I was a disruptor in that industry uh, than all of the other four commissioners, including the chairman, put together, uh, times two. And I ran out of my budget because uh, one, despite the fact that uh, everyone I spoke to would offer to pay expenses and things like that, I really felt that it was a public obligation to go do it. And, um, and two, um, I, I, uh, when I ran out of money, I basically paid for these trips out of my own pocket and, you know, another 10 or $15,000 each year I was there. And, uh, I also, number three knew, as many people know that they're the people who opposed what I was talking about were just lying there and wait for me to make a mistake. And, and, and that happens all the time, there's always somebody lying in wait for you uh, to make a mistake. Uh, whether it, and it frankly doesn't matter whether it's public office or whether you're building a bridge somewhere or you, there's it, there's someone on the other side who's learned to manage the the media and other institutions of government uh, to go after you and try to stop what you're doing. So, um, and then later, for example, when I was um, when I was uh, uh, heading the Jones Act Reform Group. Um, I did not take a salary uh, because I would then have had to register as a lobbyist, which I didn't want to do. And um, and the and the Jones Act um, supporters, the, the coalition against us, um, you know, actually attempted to 
uh, get me charged with some violation of lobbying law. And of course, they were shocked to find out I had actually thought it through and therefore didn't take a salary and therefore couldn't be called a lobbyist because I wasn't receiving remuneration. So you were on, you were on, you weren't on the take and they were shocked. They couldn't believe somebody wasn't on the take. Right. That's right. So, you know, um, and how that gets back to your question, um, uh, you know, most presidents, certainly in our lifetimes, have been very cognizant of both the, the image and the power of the presidency, as well as the lack of power, And which I want to talk to in a minute, because I do think what this brings up is this whole issue of executive power and the creeping power of the executive branch. But, um, you know, George um, uh, Bush Sr. and Ronald Reagan uh, famously said they would never go into the Oval Office without a, a suit and tie. And, uh, you know, some of these folks were shocked, just shocked, to see Obama, President Obama, with his feet on the desk. Mm. Uh, I, I imagine myself in a similar situation, and actually I work with my feet on my desk. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, you know, I guess it, the blood flows better to my brain or something. So um, uh, Nixon, to get around all of that, basically had a little hideaway office off to the side of the Oval Office uh, where he could take off his jacket and roll up his sleeves and loosen his tie and, and, uh, and, and hoard Trump has, in. yeah, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> <And a> hoard, <laughs> break in, right? Uh, the hideaway but, office was the right. source of many of trouble. Yeah, that's right. Probably. But yeah, uh, Bill Clinton too. That's right. But then again, how does it, you know, how does that affect your ego? I, 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 I still, Remember, I was not there, but of course, I've read about it so many times. The, the uh, 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 Jim Baker, uh, who was, was then Secretary of State, I think, um, might have been Chief of Staff, but I think he, no, he was Secretary of State, I think, um, was arguing with President George H.W. Bush 41 um, about something, and and Bush said, well, if you're so smart, why aren't you president? <laughs> <laughs> and so... So, so, of course, it has to go to your head a little bit that you are the president and right. you know, all these things. But but I think Trump really takes this to a whole new level. And and I think he, he does, whether he deliberately thinks it out as a performer or whether he just is that way because he is a performer, um, who knows uh, what the answer is. But but we do know that he has said that he said that several people reported he he said on several occasions that he had to, well, actually he said it himself in front of the, um, the uh, conservative uh, journalists, remember a couple of weeks ago, where he said, you know, um, I, I know my tweets will set everybody off. And I, I, I sent out a tweet and it was a beauty, remember? <laughs> and and uh, that was about as revealing as you could possibly be about his whole strategy uh, 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 being on 24-7. Yeah, he admitted in one press conference about a month or two ago that he watches how how much engagement he gets, how many likes, oh, yeah. all that. Same and one. Ben Shapiro has has repeatedly said the best way for the president to get reelected is for the White House staff to create a Twitter-like app with fake robots that make the president think that he actually tweeted, but really it's just a bunch of fake bots going, "Good job, Mr. President. Way to go." <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> well, but but now the other side of that is you know, so that, you know the, all these things have nuance to them too. So so you know this morning they were talking on the news how his base, um, which has been uh, plus or minus a couple points off of thirty five or six or thirty nine thereabouts, that uh, was down a little bit this week, I think, and um, and they make they keep hammering on the fact that he hasn't really grown it. I mean, he's grown at a couple points for a while, but it would be, you would be hard pressed to find anyone uh, among any candidates who can say, I have 40% of the public on my side, no matter what I do. Right. Right. Okay. So that's a pretty good base. And he doesn't even need to get 10% more uh, to, to win. He only needs about 7% more if you, if you assume that you know, an excess of five million votes is off in California. Yeah, you mentioned you wanted to touch on executive power, and I think that was highlighted perfectly by Trump's tweet on Friday, where he yes. hereby orders companies not to not to trade with one of our biggest trading partners, and then he floated this emergency presidential act from the seventies, and and of course all these free marketeers that were Ron Paul fans on my Facebook that now are <laughs> Trump fans or 
arguing against the free market and the president can do it because it's an emergency. And it's like, guys, a national emergency is when both ha all the houses of Congress and both parties are standing with their hands over their heart out front of the Congress going, God bless America, because 9-11 right. <laughs> happened the day before. Pearl Harbor is a national emergency. Donald Trump tantruming with China and tariffs is not a national emergency. And but it just highlights that the tools that have developed for the president to kind of do whatever the president wants to do, regardless of power. And it really the administrative state is is growing and becoming more and more powerful. And it's and it's very uh, concerning. Well, it is. And I think um, but but uh, again, on that point, it turns out there is a law somewhere. I think it's 1977 that if there's an international economic emergency, uh, he he might well have the power to do just that. And, and I think what's interesting here uh, is how much, how much um, uh, his staff has been researching ways for him to use existing law to, uh, to, uh, to give him powers or to find powers that people had not thought about when they wrote the law. Um, you know, Bill Barr himself is one of those guys who, uh, has uh, written about he, did, he didn't call it the imperial presidency, but he what he he supports a very strong presidency and the use of executive orders and all of that. And here now we have a president who's doing it. And um, you know Obama did it. I I think back all the way back to Richard Nixon in uh, seventy or seventy one when um, we had uh, you know he he um, uh, had an executive order basically that created. Um, the the, uh, the the economic council and that's not the name of it but that and cost controls and everything else he'd spent years and years including right up through the 1970s saying he opposed price controls and then bam um, uh, inflation uh, tipped just over six percent and and uh, unemployment was just under six percent and that combination was enough to set in a kind of panic and he he, uh, you know, he did what he did, which was impose 90-day price controls with a sign, you know, wave of the wand and, and a sign of the pen. And for for us uh, now, of course, I know I understand what price controls are, but for those less seasoned uh, listeners, those younger who may not understand what a price control is, can you kind of give us some background on that, please? Well, basically, um, what uh, what they what a price control does is it uh, it's it. Um, well, what they did were a number of things. Um, they did a 90-day freeze on wages and prices to counter inflation. So you could not raise your wages uh, or lower them, and you could not uh, raise your prices or lower them. And it was the first time the U.S. government ever had done it since World War II. So it wasn't the first time it had ever been done. Uh, but he also, um, he did, uh, he, he directed uh, Secretary Connolly. John Connolly was in the Secretary of the Treasury, and for those who don't remember, he was also governor of Texas, writing in the limousine ahead of John Kennedy when he was uh, assassinated, and he himself was shot. Um, and some think by one of the bullets that went through Kennedy he was part of that. Uh, but uh, he ordered him to uh, to suspend convertibility of the dollar into gold and other reserve assets. You know, gold was still was still uh, I believe gold was still the standard, and it was no longer the standard later. Um, it's what they call closing the gold window. Um, so the foreign governments couldn't exchange their dollars for gold. They used to be able to do that, and now they can't. They haven't been able to do it essentially s since then. Um, and then they put a, a surcharge of about 10% on American on imports, so that you know U.S. products wouldn't be at a disadvantage. And that was literally all with a stroke of a pen. And um, uh, so. I think we have seen a steady increase in the powers of the presidency. And, you know, there was a book written uh, at uh, some time after the Nixon administration called The Imperial Presidency. And it was aimed at Nixon, but you know, the lessons certainly apply to everyone since, uh, which is uh, the, the, the inability of the Congress to act or come together to make sausage is drives presidents nuts. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, there's another book called it's. It's got this purposely bland title by the Mises Institute, um, called "Reassessing the Presidency," and it basically is this radical book decrying the power of the presidency, and they they gave it this bland title so people would kind of be fooled into getting it. But you know, the Mises Institute's <laughs> anarchist basically. Um, but yeah, that's that's a that's an interesting insight. So it, it's always amazing to me when we talk or if I read about the Nixon administration and that whole era, you, you think, wow, it couldn't be any worse than this. And this is sort of always the, the best part about reading history. You go, it can't be any worse. It, history is the antidote to hysteria yeah. because you hear about price controls and what Nixon was doing and the gold standard and all that. And you go, things aren't as bad as it was back then in terms of government overreach. Yes, there is a lot of government overreach. It's certainly grown. The deficit is a huge concern, but you hear about that and you go, all right, Trump, Trump's tariffs sound like a fraction, like a quarter of, of what Nixon was doing with some of that price control. Well, stuff. sort of yes and no, actually. I, I, I think if you think about history, you know, what the imperial, the point of the imperial presidency, the book, it was Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Oh, okay. Um, he, he, he had two concerns, that the presidency has, was becoming uncontrollable and that it exceeded its constitutional limits. And those are things about which you and every libertarian and every conservative, all of us should be concerned about. Um, and it was based on his observations, you know, up through the 1930s. And think about George Washington had one secretary, right. basically, and then a handful of cabinet departments. But up until the 30s, the president had very few staff. Most of them were in the, in the Capitol building. The president had his own office, which was then called the president's room. Um, and now they may use it for ceremonial, but in the, you know, the last two centuries, the, the, they were really just there with a small staff. So then you have the Great Depression and you have World War II. And of course that changed everything in terms of uh, the president's need for analysis and staff to carry out things and come up with new ideas and blah, 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 blah. Um, Today, of course, it's huge. You know, the president's got a very large um, executive staff, um, some in the West Wing, which was added by Teddy Roosevelt uh, in order to expand his staff <laughs> and, yeah. you know, at the turn of the previous century and the century before, you know, 1900s. And then uh, and the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, which is the um, old executive office building next door and the new one across the street the OEOB and NEOB, and, and there, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of people um, who are in there working on uh, the presidency. And so, um, so you have these people, and they're, they're essentially professionals. You know, these, this could be what you might call the swamp. I mean, they, they're people who, who work on the president's budget. You know, the president didn't used to do the budget. The Congress was supposed to send him the budget for him to spend. And at some point that changed. And so he has to do a budget and he has to decide what his programs are that he wants. And, he, and somebody has to flesh them out. And then they have the issue of can they control the cabinet secretaries who uh, one might think are somewhat independent, but the reality is they're political appointees, even though they're approved by the Congress. Um, so, um, and then, and then you know, they, uh, Roosevelt had, uh, Franklin Roosevelt had what they called the kitchen cabinet with his buddies that played poker and all that. And Truman had a similar kitchen cabinet of business guys and cabinet friends and other others who were not. And, and um, um, that, you know, under Reagan and Nixon, that was sort of referred to as a court. So right. um, I would argue that um, Trump has taken it to the far extreme, which is um, he really, he had really has courtiers in the classic sense of people yeah. whose job it is to say yes yeah. <laughs> so they're courting him, you know, all the time. Um, and there are a few standouts who obviously try to do to think about the public at large. Yeah. Uh, uh, Stephen Miller doesn't strike me as uh, Edmund Stanton. I mean, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> right. Miller is, uh, I, no, I don't no. know him. And, I, you know, he just seems, seems like a thoroughly uh, dislikable individual. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's uh well, let's let's talk before we run out of time. The, kind of our final thing that we wanted to talk about, which is a looming recession. A lot of economists are saying yeah. uh, the, the the June of 2020 next year. 
Uh, I just did an episode of the Chris Spangle show. If you go listen to that podcast, you can hear yeah. what, what may be happening there. But when you talk about the swamp and you talk about power in DC, I mean, it doesn't get any more swampy than the federal reserve and Jerome Powell and uh, man, Trump has been beating up on him a lot saying, and a lot of people saying, Hey, quit talking us into a recession. I mean, what, what are some, what's your take on some of that? Well, I, th I think that I, th I think this is very sort of a fraught moment. Um, I, I think there's a danger in uh, looking back to history for guidance too, which is that um, and particularly in economics and we talk about economic cy cycles as if they are, immutable, but in fact, there are lots of different kinds of cycles. And I think our understanding of how the economy works is probably better. I, I would hope that we got better at understanding it. We are now with the 10th or 11th year of this expansion. Um, um, we're certainly not in a recession now. Um, and I was listening this morning, some of the media, and they're saying that the consensus of economists is that we may well be in one by the end of 2020, which will uh, be post the election and you know recessions you don't typically know you're in it until you're halfway out of it you, right. you actually have to have a, a declaration that you've had two down cycles if i remember um so and yes um a lot of what's hold, driving us right now is consumer confidence um although that i think was down four points uh in the last report yeah. although it has been rising and up so I, don't, I do not disagree with people who say you can sort of talk yourself into a recession. So I suspect that Trump and his people, you know, he got a report from somebody that one of his advisors that, you know, this and that, and the tariffs are having a massive impact on the economy. And, and of course, he doesn't tend to think about how much our economy is driven by exports and imports from other countries and, and all of economic theory. He's, you know, he's just this sort of, Queen's business guy who thinks things should work the way he wants them to work. And it's a yeah. very narrow universe. So in some ways, the worst aspect of the tariffs is that they have really massively undermined the economies of European and Asian allies for us. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, now, and of course, Friday, you know, I'm watching my stocks go down three or four points too. <laughs> so, and everybody with a 401k is watching that go up and down and up and down and, and the swings are not delightful. Well, I'll, I've thought for months that we may be in a recession currently because I manage a lot of subscription services and, you know, for We Are Libertarians, for instance, our Patreon, we'd lost one or two a month for the 20 months we had had it. And then earlier this year, we lost like 30 in three <laughs> months. I mean, it, and then people who are just kind of like on fringy cash businesses or services, everybody was telling me all through this year, business is down. And then we just had the state fair and you walk around the expo hall, which is where all like kind of the vendors are. And you ask them like, how are you doing this year? They said, attendance, it seems to be way down. There's a lot less people here. Nobody's buying anything. Well, of course, who makes up the bulk of the buying power at the state farm? It's farmers in a state right. that's 80% agrarian. Uh, agriculture there's the state fair brought less people less people could go less people f farmers spent less money at vendors and concessions so i think it has i think it's it's those little telltale signs that you can kind of, kind of sometimes see and you well, go but, but that's anecdotal sectoral, but but those are sectoral I mean right yeah you're you're exactly right that farmers have been hit probably the worst yeah um, uh, there is a kind of shrug out of many farmers though which is you know, we always take the brunt of it. This is going to be good for everybody else when it's all over, kind of blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I and I get that attitude. But, you know, the reality is even if you feel that way, you, you may not be able to afford to drive to the state fair or think it's going to be worth your time to do it. So right. I think some of what you're seeing, Chris, is because of where you live. Um, I, I cannot say I see any slowdown whatsoever here in the, the middle Atlantic states. And, mm. um, and you know, I see new businesses, I see restaurants competing vigorously for each other's business. Uh, although, although one of the major restaurant tours locally uh, said to me recently that last year, uh, restaurant business was down 8% among all restaurants. And he mm. felt that was because there was so much new competition. So, yeah. you know, so it was supply was out, out running demand. 
Um, and, you know, where I'm currently living, I, there's a dozen interesting restaurants, four, really, four or five really good ones. And then uh, there's three new buildings going up and they all have restaurants in them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but um, so I, I don't think the signs are there. I think that's, I think that's probably why Powell is so reluctant. Powell is a, a good, I, it, it turns out that um, he was involved with uh, a charter school that my wife, of which my wife is now chairman in mm -hmm. the district. And, you know, he is a very well thought of guy. And he, of course, is the candidate establishment if you can't have Janet Yellen or Ben Bern Bernanke or one of these guys. And honestly, for the Fed, you want somebody who is conservative about the levers of government because the Fed can kind of make you or break you. And I know we all know that what he's thinking about and 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 maybe someone will say, well, this is a swamp working against Trump. Um, what he's thinking about is if there is a recession uh, the and for which there's some likelihood in the near future, one or two or three or four years, you know, you can't keep going on an expansion. What, what levers will he have if it happens? And really the only lever they have is interest rates. And, you know, they only have uh, uh, a point or two to play with right now uh, uh, in, in case something happens. And, and as he says, you know, the, the trade part of the equation is something he can't do anything about. He cannot ameliorate the impact of it all by himself. Uh, now, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk. There was an interesting article I saw, by the way, on um, I think two days ago about, uh, I can't remember the author, uh, but maybe I'll send it to you and put it on the website. But he was saying the Chinese win either way. <clears throat> if if uh, it, it could, they could just simply wake Trump out and take all the pain and they're sort of used to it. And right. in which case, it's just going to get worse and worse. We might trigger a recession. And then he won't be reelected. And they can say to everyone else, well, we knocked off an American president. Yeah. Or alternatively, um, he can grant them some concessions because the pain is a little too much here. And he would probably argue people are too weak. They should trust him um, with, <laughs> without a, not a lot of good cause to do that. Um, and make a deal that's not particularly good for us or anything else. And then the Chinese can again say, well, you see, we beat an American president. So the rest of you in Europe and Asia and everywhere else need to listen to us in either case. So, uh, so the, art, the author was arguing that Trump has now gotten us into a situation uh, in which there is no win-win for us in either way. But uh, to counter that, I mean, Trump has kind of, I think for me, in a lot of ways, exposed the Chinese for who they are. Yes. I, I, I was just kind of took for granted that, oh, well, they're liberalizing, you know, Nixon yeah. opened China, and now they're becoming more democratic. Yeah. And then, you know, Z becomes basically emperor, and they start cracking down. And then you look at what's, you know, amassing yeah. troops on the Hong Kong border and the social credit system, and you start, and two million political prisoners locked yeah. up in the last few years churches yeah. being raised like you start to, you're right you start to put this all together and you go you know trump may be correct about china and they they do rip us off in a lot of ways i don't agree with his policy but i do i do think that i think the american political system took for granted that china was a partner instead of a foe and i think he has sort of recentered the idea of which is just the truth is that the Chinese are not to be trusted. They don't have our best interest out. They're not, we, we do need them for trade and for manufacturing, but at the same time, they're not looking out for our best interests. They're no. not, they're well, not the and, British. Well, and, and she is exactly the opposite of Trump, which is that he is calculating farsighted tactical and strategic both. Right. He understands where he wants to go and he's doing everything that he wants to get done. And, and everything you've said is correct, Chris. And I have experienced um, uh, the theft of my intellectual property over there. And um, they are absolutely repressive. You, you have to admit that American companies and European companies with their technology have helped him um, become so. Um, you know, a lot of the facial recognition and the electronic technologies being used to create the national social credit score that they're using to determine whether you get to go to school or have children or, you know, get to go to lunch or 
get a political position or anything. That American companies, American companies are at the root of that. And of course, I worry about uh, how how soon will American government try to apply that here? And facial recognition is a great tool for the police, but it's also one that can be uh, wildly misused. Uh, uh, gene typing is another one. Um, um, uh, you know, license plate databases, all of these things um, are proceeding, kind of proceed willy-nilly. And I don't think we as a country have developed a new set of rules ourselves to deal with that. And, I, you know, a lot of these things that start on the, uh, over there in Russia or China or whatever are really the leading edge of what's going to happen or has already happened here uh, in uh, Western society. Um, just think about, and we've talked about it before, England, where you can be on camera 175 or 80 times a day. Yeah. Um, is that a good thing? I don't think so. Uh, do the police think it's a good thing? Absolutely, they love it. Um, can we now start predicting, we, we, you know, we're talking about, can we predict when somebody's going to shoot somebody? And, um, you know, you're starting to see people, um, can we use AI on people's, uh, artificial intelligence on people's um, uh, Facebook accounts or their, you know, their Instagram or whatever to detect whether they're likely to do something. Well, that is exactly where we don't want to be. And, uh, you know, to remind yourself of what that's like, just take a look again at the Tom Cruise movie of 20 years ago. Um, uh, I can't remember that name either, but. Um, My minority it, Report. Minority Report, yes. That, that is the future. And um, we, ha we, we do not stop long enough ever to ask ourselves, is that the future we would like to have? And I, I hate to say, but I think the millennials and xenials and, and, um, and a little bit of your generation, you're, I think you're older than a millennial, right? Uh, I am at the very beginning of it. I'm, I'm a couple years yeah, in. Yeah, you're at the, yeah so, but you're at the leading edge. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there's less knowledge uh, about... Um, uh, the history of all of these things than one would like and about the right to be independent and, and, uh, you know, and have privacy. Yeah. Have, privacy. Have just I, privacy. Like the idea that privacy has gone. It's, right, another, the, oh, it's another whole thing, right? Right. It's a digital panopticon. I mean, look up yep. panopticon. If you're not yep, familiar with right. the idea, it's, I mean, it literally yeah. drove people mad in, I believe England or Pennsylvania, but the, the reality is that when the, the supposedly small government Republican president is comfortable floating the idea of using your Apple Watch or Android phone yeah. or Alexa device to listen in on whether or not you should be allowed to have a gun or not. Yeah. Uh, and using that as a database, like, and I had a couple friends kind of privately message me and go, hey, I don't want to get attacked in your Facebook. Like, what's the problem? This seems like this could help stop a lot of domestic issues, like a lot of mass shootings. Because they're using it under yeah. uh, under the pretense of stopping mass shootings. Well, but I do. Yes, it is a pretense, and I right. think. Yes, I, I think, and the and the the notion that this is all about mental illness has been shown to be absolutely not true. You know, the FBI did a study of mass shooters, and I think less than fifteen or twenty percent of of all of them could be considered to be mental illness. Um, obviously, there are issues when people do what they do there, but. Um, Everything you do about mental illness, none of that, very little of that, will have any impact on any of this. And um, now, th what could have an impact? To, you know, there are there are serious things you could do. You could restrict uh, the size of gun magazines, and you could uh, you could categorize uh, automatic weapons in the same category as bazookas and other things, which are already forbidden to the public. But I don't want to go down that path, particularly here. But the notion that we want to be listened to all the time and and uh, some artificial intelligence deciding if we're going to shoot somebody is it's pretty yeah have you ever had a fight with your wife yeah you know i mean when you're watched i, I would right. always lose <laughs> right but when you are when you are being watched it's very easy when you're being watched to cherry pick and, yeah. and then it can be used in whatever way you want so it's just it's a terrifying notion that someone would even entertain that idea in the oval office and that, but you that, know, somebody said it to him. You uh, know, right. someone somewhere said, "Well, we could be doing this or that." And, it, it's the and chairman trying to it. find a way. But 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 Chris, guy, what he's trying to yeah, do is, is this guy Wagner? 
Yeah, yeah but sorry. it's trying to find a way not to do anything. Right, right. Okay, and to put it off on something else. So. Uh, okay, so let's wrap up with the Diner's Guide to DC. Uh, yeah. You're quite uh, the, uh, the well, I was uh, thinking, diner in DC. I was thinking the other day that, um, or this morning in particular, so um, what I'm going to suggest today is that um, if you go to Washington, that you uh, go to the baseball game down at Nats Park in the Navy Yard area. It's uh, I am living there. I think I've mentioned several of the restaurants before, but it is an incredibly cool place um, these days. Uh, there are events outside. It's um, it's well designed. There's a lot of energy, and there there are tons of restaurants that are good. They're ranging from several on the waterfront, Anna at the district winery, which is an interesting story about a guy making wine who started in New York City, um, uh, to um, Osteria, Osteria Marini, which re reopened after a fire, which is really very high-end Italian, to, uh, to uh, Chloe, which I've mentioned before, which is one of the city's uh, best chefs, uh, and to uh, Schilling, which I talked about last time, to Salt Line, and, uh, uh, there in that side, there are a number of restaurants all clustered uh, close up to the ballpark and around me. They, if you want to escape, they're over there. So if you're going to Washington, uh, you ought to plan a Saturday over in the Navy Yard area. And if you hit the timing right before, um, I think before the end of uh, October, maybe earlier, uh, there's a street um, food scape. Uh, that is uh, called a smorgasburg, which started mm -hmm. in New York, which has about 25 different restaurants uh, or little uh, food stands uh, to fireworks at night, sometimes and music on Friday. So that's fun. Uh, that would be a great little one day trip. You could do the Smithsonian in the morning and and then uh, you're not all that far away or you could do the Capitol and walk on down. Cool. Very good. Well, it was great yeah. talking to you. Uh, we're we're closer in episodes than we've been ever before so yes, we're well, working on it we literally were like trying to arrange our schedules and he's like how about this day i'm like nope how about this day nope how? so we're, <laughs> we're we always try to get together every couple weeks so we'll we'll start planning a week ahead and i suspect there's gonna be a lot more to talk about as we move along here uh, oh for sure <laughs> there, this is gonna be one spectacular <laughs> presidential cycle so i can't wait to, to That's hear right, more describe it as spectacular <laughs> maybe yeah. as a spectacle Yes. <laughs> All right, Rob, thank you so much for joining yep. us here on the program. Totally, Chris. Have a good one. Let me hit stop.